Shadow of the Colossus. One of only a handful of greatest games of all time mainstays since its release in 2005 is a thoroughly appreciated work which has more than cut through the generational gap that's emerged since its release and unquestionably cemented its place as a titan of a game. It is the spiritual successor to Eco, which was itself, I argue, the culmination of the fifth generation's experimentations with 3D polygons and artificial intelligence. In terms of exploring those aspects of the medium, Shadow of the Colossus picks up where that game left off and its relationship with its contemporaries is roughly as frayed as Eco's is. Team Eco's games all have such a wholly different feel from everything else and yet are so thoroughly thought out that they all seem to have magically emerged from an alternate timeline where games like this have been made for years. In an interview, the game's director Fumito Ueda remarked that he rarely gets conceptions on the basis of a story when making video games, but that he always has a conscious desire to have a story that is appropriate for the video game medium. And something he finds is that the more you layer complexity onto a video game narrative, the more mediocre it becomes. Which is why he always aims to have relatively straightforward stories in his games. Eco was about escaping a castle and then defeating the evil queen. And the particularities that made it prime video game material was that the protagonist was interacting with Yorda, holding hands with an AI. Shadow of the Colossus is about killing 16 Colossi to revive a girl, and the particularities that make it prime video game material, and why these games feel so fully thought out, will be the subject of this video. Hello everyone, I'm Aesir Aesthetics, and this is my in-depth look at Shadow of the Colossus. I'm picking up right where my eco video left off, so I recommend watching that first. Before watching further, make sure you have a cup of coffee on hand, maybe a notepad in case of a pop quiz, and lastly, please don't let this be your first exposure to the game. If you can't access the original or the remaster, the remake is, I think, handily the best ever made, and I'm not just saying that because some Bluepoint staffers follow me on Twitter, it's genuinely a worthy substitute if it's all you can access. That prelude business behind us, let's take a look back at Shadow of the Colossus. Development of Shadow of the Colossus began in 2002, shortly after the release of Eco under the working title Niko. Ni is Japanese for two. Ni Eco Niko. Very clever and Team Eco was comprised of 35 people. Chiefly for our purposes, the development was spearheaded by two men, the game's lead designer Fumito Ueda and its producer Kenji Kaido. Ueda served as the creative lead, with Kaido's job consisting mainly of getting Ueda's vision from concepts to code. These two set up an arduous hiring policy to ensure the highest of quality would be maintained with each hiring being made from a pool of roughly 500 resumes. Like Ego before it, the game started development with the creation of a concept trailer whose job it was to anchor the team to a solid vision and to give them a sense of what the final product would be. Whenever the team got lost in the wilderness or got overburdened mentally by getting the concepts to function in game, this concept trailer was there to reorient them. Compared to Eco's concept trailer, what we see here is actually recognizable as a video game, which makes a certain amount of sense considering Shadow of the Colossus is a much more conventional game than Eco was. Ueda has described Eco as not a video game but a story told through a computer, a game very much made to appeal to non-gamers. Shadow of the Colossus, however, was made with gamers in mind, and more specifically, he described it as a boy game. Which makes a certain amount of sense considering the expression of the AI relationship. If Team Eco has a trademark other than minimalism, it's that they like the challenge of making AI creatures behave realistically. Both concept trailers emphasize the player interacting with AI, but where Eco was about cooperating with it, 
Shadow of the Colossus is about fighting it. And in that way, Shadow of the Colossus is a much more traditionally masculine game than Eco was. We're not building a relationship with an ethereal girl. Our AI creatures are the Colossi, and our relationship with them is expressed with violence. And, contrary to what you might expect from the trailer, it was actually decided early on that the game would exclusively contain one-on-one -on -one fights. Agro and Wander being counted as one, of course. The reason for the absolute exclusion of more general enemies was that Ueda and Kendo agreed that since the Colossi would be the highlights of the game, it didn't make sense to spend the programmer's time on non-Colossi. And this is a very Team eco -y rationale. Fumito Ueda is a minimalist and goes through an extensive consideration period for every proposed new inclusion. Every implementation must justify its presence in the game both in terms of making sense and feeling elegant. The sword's light beam demanded the creation of light spots, which meant for a believable experience, light would need to mimic the human eye. So each area was mapped out so that, for example, when you exited a cave and went to a bright spot, the light starts out blinding, but then the camera adapts. All of this for this. Another example of the meticulous review process for a potential inclusion can be seen in the Spider Colossus, which was initially planned for the game. It would have been defeated by riding aggro to it and slicing at its feet, but Ueda decided to cut it simply because it didn't justify the creation of a horse riding sword swinging animation. This madman has likened his own philosophy to the pruning of tree branches, he feels it is necessary to cut components in order to improve the quality of the whole, and Kaido reasoned in interviews that this was a major way the game's quality was maintained. This cutting philosophy is popularly referred to as subtract design, and it aims to balance out a game by removing elements that interfere with the core experience. A big focus of development was to challenge players' expectations for boss battles and the achievements made to get this thing running are truly something to behold. Among them are the game's player dynamics and reactions, as well as the organic collision deformation, two terms coined by Kaido which refer to the player's response to environmental stimuli, for example when a colossus shakes the player should shake with it, and the physics of the colossi as scalable creatures. Like, if a Colossus's hand is outstretched horizontally, that hand should be a surface the player could run on. The Colossi themselves proved to be delicate balancing acts, since they both needed to provide a challenge, as well as lead the player into how to take them down, and after some time, developers realized that the innate size of the Colossi would be a major factor for how they would be designed. The larger a Colossus is, the harder it is to keep it completely in frame, so for the player to have an intuitive sense of what's going on in the fight, the larger Colossi all have very slow and telegraphed attacks. But this wasn't solely a gameplay consideration. When put to the test, the game's physics engine produced unnatural looking results when the Colossi's speeds were amped up. The smaller colossi being the exception, since they aren't ever scaled. Uh, well, the player can hang on to their back, but what I mean is, they never need to be still long enough for the player to move around on them. And since they rarely have projectile attacks, it made sense for them to move faster to pose a threat. Ueda's background is art and animation, so it's to be expected that his games lean on these elements for spectacle, and what we find in the Colossi is an application of the big things in animation rule. Generally speaking, you want larger things to move slower to give their scale impact. A game is a solution to its own problems, and as I've just expanded on, the core concept of fighting giant monsters created a lot of the limitations the developers had to design around. But here's what makes Team Eco special. At no point in development does it seem like Ueda's creative vision was softballed to cope with the technological realities. Rather, 
when something didn't work, it was just back to the drawing board until they got something that did and all throughout, immense changes were made to designs to better align them with Ueda's vision. Team Eco is the realization of the dream every creative has about total artistic freedom backed up by money, and from Eco onwards, the team has had no problem getting their projects on the shelves without executive interference. True, The Last Guardian was stuck in development hell, but that had exclusively to do with technological limitations. Sony kept the project alive for nine long years. This belief people put into this team might be tied to their track record of delivering nothing but medium-defining excellence, uh, their games cut through player barriers and deliver experiences that are so unique that they justify console sales on their own. These experiences are moody pieces of game design masterclasses and that game design aspect of Team Eco often gets neglected. Eco's mood was tuned to the experience of traversing a castle with a friend, and that game had an abundance of mechanics to prop that mood up, Yorda being key. Combat was about protecting her, not fighting monsters. Traversal was about making paths for her, not fun platforming. The separation in the end played on the conditioning of not wanting to leave her by herself. Shadow of the Colossus's mood, however, is tuned to the lonely hero. As I noted already, one key aspiration of Team Ecos was to change the player's expectations of boss battles, and although it toys around with some conventions, much like Eco before it, Shadow of the Colossus isn't about reinventing the wheel. It has an iron devotion to the laws governing good game design, and again, like Eco, this game is a marriage of high-end software design and a strong game design foundation in service of a creative vision. Shadow of the Colossus is ostensibly a 3D action game where you periodically write to bosses to kill them. The game is comprised of 16 colossi, which are all preempted by a horse ride to their location, which has the player navigate the game world guided by light cast from Wander's magical sword, and once a colossus is reached, the player is asked to figure out by pointing that same sword where their weakness is, which sets up the follow-up question, how is it slain? While some colossi are massive creatures which the player needs to scale, others are smaller and more fierce and require the player to lure them through environmental hazards, which will do most of the job of taking them out. Others still act more like set pieces than actual fights, with the puzzle of how to take them out being mostly answered by level design or camera angles. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The game opens up on an eagle flying, which our camera chases until we reach Wander and Agro entering a forbidden land named The Forbidden Land. His entry into the Forbidden Land contrasts Eco's delivery to the Queen's Castle in some interesting ways. For one, Eco was sent during the day, Wander enters by night. Eco was delivered as sacrifice, Wander brings Mono's sacrificed corpse with him. Eco's quest was to escape, Wander's quest is to conquer. Kind of. All of Ueda's games have to do with a young boy navigating in an unknown land, but Wander is the only protagonist thus far, which the story emphasizes has agency and more importantly, power, independent of their allies. At least in the beginning. Because the game has this sense of eventuality running throughout it. There's this sense that causality itself is conspiring to doom Wander and while that may just be the result of the game being predetermined, as it is a video game, I think it still informs the work. After bringing Mono to the shrine in the heart of the land, shadowy creatures, known as the Shadow Creatures, emerge with dubious intentions, but Wander fends them off with a magical sword he stole prior to his arrival. This impresses the deity Dorman, who explains that the reversal of death is impossible by human laws, but that, with the ancient sword, Wander need not be barred his request. Should he slay the Colossi, Dorman's request, 
Mono's revival will be his reward, but before Wander can accept, Dorman warns him of the cost this request carries with it. Undeterred, Wander makes a deal, and this is where the game begins. Notably, returning from Eco is a make sense philosophy for the tutorial. The opening cutscene is Wander riding Acro, so the player will naturally be pulled to riding her. A camera angle points the player to their heading, which is straight forwards after exiting the shrine, and here's a departure from Eco. Now we have text prompts telling us how to play. They teach us how to jump and how to reflect the sunlight as a means of guiding our direction. This light beam embodies subtract design and balance because it was created to get around unnatural NPCs. Ueda dislikes characters who are just info dumps to guide the player's progress because a character which repeats the same dialogue over and over again feels artificial and imbues the larger game with that sense of artificiality, so the light beam was a way of giving the player their heading without imbuing the game with a sense of artificiality. Also, this light beam is mostly how we, the player, know that this sword is magical. Banishing shadows in cutscenes is fine, but lighting the path is something you do with it, and what you do in game will always have more impact than what you see in cutscenes. After reaching the cliff, we have to leave Acro behind so that the climbing tutorial can start. Plant life, architecture, and natural terrain are all made scalable here, so you know what to look for going forwards, and with most of the core gameplay intuited, the player is ready to tackle the first Colossus. It's Ueda's favorite, and he put a lot of work into it, thinking it would be the make or break factor for hooking the player. The Colossi don't have official official names, Development names are mostly descriptions like the Minotaur Bros or Leo, but unofficially. The fandom has given them all names which I'll be using from now on. Colossus number one is Valus, and the skills learned thus far all carry over into the fight. Point the sword to guide the way, point the sword to find his weak spot. Climb up a cliff to reach this Colossus, climb up a Colossus to reach said weak spot. Like I said earlier, makes sense philosophy tutorial, and this nigh invisible learning tunnel the game funnels you through is one way to define elegance. Another definition is seen in the gameplay loop of the game, right, then fight. Then after defeating a colossus, watch Wander get impaled by the black tendrils, actually blood which you cannot escape. Another link to what I said earlier about the game having a sense of eventuality running throughout it, and get teleported back to the shrine to have his next heading given to him by Dorman. Repeat until the end game. While riding Acro to Quadratus, the second colossus, you may notice that the pointing of the light beam has another utility in that it's effectively a crosshair which draws your eye to the intricacies of the environmental design. And before you meet Quadratus, you'll have learned that the camera is way more directed than in your average 3D action game. Shadow of the Colossus prioritizes a balance between freedom and the appreciation of the scenic beauty of its setting. When you ride Acro, the camera does a pan to the left in order to make your destination take center stage, and some locations have hard-coded angles and locations for the camera to snap to, like the bridge. But this also has some gameplay utility. It draws your eye to the beach down below, which is where you'll be fighting the second Colossus, which is also the game's first potential horse fight, and is where you're taught to use the bow. I have no developer say so on this one, but it wouldn't surprise me if the bow mechanic was initially designed solely to integrate Acro into combat, and expand it from there into being how you lure the Colossi, and how you take down the lizards and fruits on the overworld. The initial highlighting of a Colossus's weak spot has you manually pull the camera view up, which puts their scale compared to Wander into context. The Colossi are universally shown to have a majesty to them, and each one highlights Wander's comparative vulnerability in a unique way. Fighting Colossi is less of an execution challenge, and more of a dance where the player and the AI trade places navigating one another. 
The Colossi aren't bosses in a traditional sense. Functionally, they're better thought of as levels. Ueda even described them as inverted Zelda dungeons, but more on that later, because I don't think this was the extent to which Zelda was an inspiration on this game. Though the Forbidden Lands don't have a talking tree, no collapsing moon, or alternate world to explore, there's some link to the past shenanigans with the layout of the world. Both have you situated in the middle of a map, whose dispersed regions house their challenges, and both end with a fight against an unleashed evil in the center map area. Visually, however, there's no link but the tenuous. Born from the need to look good in bad draw distance, Team Eco's games have an aesthetic that is at all times realistic yet fantastical. And the fantastical is usually conveyed in the man-made geometry, which, while not insane, veers just far enough into strange territory to make you question the exact reality of the setting. The game's mood is mostly, though not only, set during the run-ups to the Colossi, where you appreciate the vistas for however long it takes you to get to your destination, then you find. Though formed from pieces of ancient ruins, the Colossi are clearly living creatures, the most significant ones you meet until the end when humans show up, and as I said earlier, your only interaction with them is hostile. You ride through a mostly empty world to meet something living, just to kill it, over and over again. If you've ever been able to revel in the melancholy mood of the game, I think this repetition might have done more to build that mood up than it gets credit for. Team Eco's games being quote-unquote devoid of content means repetition will surface as a natural way to infer meaning. Comes with the territory, like how in Eco failing to rescue Yorda mid-combat would result in a wave of petrification capturing Eco. Him being turned to stone was among the most pronounced failure states in the entire game and so, when the game wanted us to meet Yorda in the end, it made sense that she'd be made out of stone, to tie that appearance of hers to a failure state we were familiar with. Repetition is more core to Shadow of the Colossus than it was to Eco. I don't think I need to expand on how, and the tweaking of returning elements is how much of the story is told, be it Wander's constantly degrading physical form, or how the colossi play into the melancholy mood of the game. We ride out into the world numerous times after deliberately making it emptier, and Quadratus' placement is nothing short of genius here. Since its beach area is in the path of so many other colossi, you're bound to notice that there's a suspicious sand mound where you fought it, and if you explore a bit deeper, you'll discover that after dying, the colossi don't only shoot lights up into the sky, spawn a new shadow to stand over Wander when he wakes up, and a new dove, but they also become parts of the level geometry where they died. So Quadratus in particular acts as a constant reminder of the fact that you're making the world emptier, and emphasizes just how much the Colossi are parts of the world. Truly, the intersection of appreciating the beautiful landscapes and the majestic Colossi is not as tangible as it seemed at first. As a designer, Ueda prefers a simple world with the semblance of living over a complex world without it, and this is one reason his games are set in ruins. A desolate world, one which hints to civilizations gone, is going to inspire the player's imagination, and will have them fill in the blanks, and the testament to Team Eco's success in world building can be seen in the fandom's obsession with the most minuscule of departures from sensicality. Is there some secret meaning behind the rings in the desert? No, there's a transparent and often elaborated on meaning, which is, it's there to invite the player's mind to wander. And if that answer isn't satisfying, that might just exemplify how well constructed the world is that you would be deeply enough drawn into it that a random piece of architecture has become significant. The run-ups to the Colossi fights all force you to breathe in the world, so it won't be easy to escape doing some theory crafting of your own, and 
As you advance, that theory crafting will veer more away from the mundane world you're clearly presented with because it is constantly being juxtaposed with the magical colossus fights. The world in between those fights picks up some of their magical residue and all of a sudden, you begin to wonder if the added grip you get from killing lizards and the added health you get from fruits are supposed to communicate something about the magical properties of the land or whether they're just soft difficulty release valves or ways to give the acro portions of the game something extra to do. One of the most pronounced visuals in the game is the bridge in and out of the Forbidden Lands, whose exact design seems to be a bit out of left field, in that you'd probably expect the support beams to have a more arced structure, like the Roman aqueducts, and another example of this unusual geometry is seen in the path to the third Colossus, Gaius. Which I consider to be the final of the tutorial bosses. That fight is set on a massive dish in the middle of a lake reached by ascending a spiraling staircase, and I think this is among the best fights in the game. The path leading to it is a platforming challenge which asks you to consider the ramifications of the environmental design, and the boss itself is defeated by learning to apply this logic to fighting. Gaius is unscalable due to his bally legs, but the Pillar Sword can't be walked on if you get Gaius to strike the Earth and get on top of it. Having Gaius do this to the platform in the middle of the fight arena will break some of the structures on his body so you can start climbing. And this integration of the environment and the bosses doesn't stop here as the next Colossus, Fida, takes this idea and runs with it. You need to lure it to poke its head into these tunnel entrances after you, so you can quickly navigate the tunnel to reach another opening from which you can run back and get on its neck. This pattern of colossi building on the previous ones isn't exclusive to the tutorial, by the way. If you've ever wondered why the colossi are positioned where they are in the game, it's because they are supposed to force the player to get craftier as their fights get more and more complicated conceptually and execution-wise. The game has a number of Colossus interactions available and the Colossi on offer all feel distinct in how they grab from these interactions and merge them. There are a few here, admittedly, which feel a bit repeaty, but even those have some gimmick which was not apparent in what they built on top of. The interactions on offer are stabbing, shooting, climbing, and luring. The first fight was the simplest in the game, a climb followed by a stab. The second was a shoot, then a climb and stab. The third was lure, getting Gaius to expose himself by slamming the platform, then a climb and a stab. And these four interactions are remixed and reinterpreted across the 16 Colossi with great results. Luring a Colossus can be something like shooting Avion and having it swoop down at you so that you can jump and scale it. Alternatively, it can be luring Barba, the bearded colossus, to the end of the room, where he'll expose his scalable beard when he tries to look at you. And the situational interpretation of each interaction is as varied as the colossi themselves. Something Avion in particular embodies, which is why I think he's so many people's favorite, outside of the visual flair of being a flying colossus, is that the difference between boring gameplay and engaging gameplay need not have anything to do with mechanical depth or system complexity. It can be as simple as the fine-tuning of stakes. This is something I note often in regards to save points, but essentially, I think the leveraging of player progress is enough to make boring things exciting. And I'm, of course, talking about the grip bar here. The navigation of the Colossi is always relatively simple, so it is hard to lose to them. But because of the constantly degrading grip bar, it's very easy to fall and lose progress. Since the grip bar has the task of getting on Avion's wings constantly running as a liability, it's so much more engaging to interact with Avion than it would be if the game had infinite stamina. Of course, what I said earlier about the core interactions being remixed across the Colossi also goes some ways, not so much into making the simple gameplay engaging, but rather keeping it engaging. 
The idea of scaling a colossus can be showcased with Wander hanging on to Deer Progress in the air with Avion, but it can also be him jetting out of cover to climb Barba's beard, or running the grip bar dangerously low while Hytris drags him underwater. And exposing a colossus's weak point can be interpreted as shooting Kuromori's feet while it's climbing the walls to have it fall and be exposed on the ground. Alternatively, it's seen in luring Basaron to a geyser which tips it over tortoise style and lets you start climbing. It can also be thought of as shooting the eyes of Dirge mid pursuit to cause it to crash into the walls of its own enclosure. What the game really embodies here is a deep realization of its core concepts. These same actions, effectively, feel incredibly different because they are presented differently. And the peculiar behaviors of the Colossi are arguably the most noteworthy achievement in the entire game. They run the gamut from the graceful Avion and Hydras to something more like the 11th Colossus Celosia, which could be described as a fierce animal whose challenge is more conventional. While its behavior leads you to kill it correctly, the innate level design of the boss isn't in the boss itself, but rather the area in which you fight it. The environmental navigation of Shadow of the Colossus is a massive step away from Eco, where puzzles were about getting Yorda from A to B more so than moving Eco around. As I just elaborated on, Shadow of the Colossus leverages progress as stakes to drive engagement. If, in Eco, the platforming were fun in and of itself, then Yorda might have felt like an impediment on that fun, which would have made players dislike her. That game was about bonding with her, so obviously, that would have been a big no-no. Shadow of the Colossus does not have Yorda, so the platforming can be incredibly satisfying as a contained activity without detracting from the game's central focus. Small touches, like how you periodically have to release your grip to regenerate stamina often on shaky terrain is enough to make the impossibly simplistic climbing sections into something deeply engaging, and the fact that it highlights Wander's vulnerability with camera angles emphasizing his small size and with animations which include a lot more recovery frames than your average game has makes it a double whammy. And another reason much of the moment-to-moment -moment of level design is so engaging, in spite of it being ostensibly simplistic, is because the inclusion of the Colossi makes it dynamic. This is luring and leading a boss like Pelagia to those elevated shrines from which you can reach its belly. It's also seen in lowering Phalanx's flight so that you can scale it. I've talked about how some Colossi are level design challenges more so than enemies, but this can even be embodied in some of the non-climbable Colossi like Zenobia, whose fight is about navigating their arena and their behavior is juggling the dual role of leading you to where you need to go as well as being led by you to where you need it to go. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that there are colossi who are both leading you through a geometry level as well as being levels themselves. Argus, the second to last colossus, must be lured to the platforms which it bends by stepping on them, letting you climb up into the mountain structure. Then, after you get Argus to break a path for you in the structure, you scale Argus itself. And what's interesting about this is that the Colossi chains from leading the player to being tools of the player on a dime, and at no point does it come across as artificial. They all have specific behaviors coded to respond to the player, and much of the why of their believability comes from the subtract design philosophy. When you have so little to do after scaling the structures around Argus, it's hard for you to feel like Argus's response is wrong. The simple omission of versatile expression from Wander's moveset is enough to secure that the Colossi's response to him never comes across as artificial and that the believability of the game and its mood be maintained. Here's another example of this. Have you ever wondered why there's a giant pillar dangling over the table Mono is laying on? Ueda put that there so that the player physically could not stand on top of her. Yup. 
When Ueda talked about his dislike of NPCs who repeat the same dialogue over and over again, he also said that he dislikes invisible walls because they betray the reasonable expectations the player has of the game. He is very concerned all throughout that the player's expectations be considered, but of course, he's a game designer, and he realizes that there are times for reality and times for convenience. Like how we are teleported back to the shrine after defeating a colossus. The game's tension cycle always begins at ground zero, when we ride aggro to the colossi, and then it starts to ramp up as we make our way to fight them. The climax of the action is in the killing blow, and since the tension cycle is reset once this climax is reached, it makes a lot of sense pacing-wise to not have the player ride aggro back. Saving in Shadow of the Colossus seems to be tuned more for maintenance of progress and invisibility rather than as a means to inform the narrative. You could read something into the significance of Dorman and the strewn around save shrines offering it to you, but as you're playing, the impact of save points is negligible outside of the game's concern for preserving your hard progress. For the record, I'm distinguishing hard progress as dying and having to read to a level as opposed to soft progress, which is something akin to falling from a boss and having to climb it again. The game feels that once you've killed the Colossus, it's dead. And even if your console dies right then and there, that progress should be maintained. On killing the Colossi, the game was supposed to challenge the player's conceptions of boss fights, and one way Ueda did this was by replacing the fanfare at the end with sadness. During development, Ueda began to question the convention of feeling good about killing monsters and started tinkering around with a new feeling to assign to the player. Sadness made sense to him, and fun fact, after he first showed the staff a colossus dying, they laughed when they heard the sad music because they all assumed it was a bug. The tinkering of the fight's surrounding emotions is also seen in the emphasis of Wander's vulnerability via slow recovery frames, and the minute-to-minute -minute emotion is directed more than it might seem. The Colossi are inverted Zelda dungeons, as Ueda said, but being living creatures means that their behavior will feel more authentic than a basic dungeon would, even though it's just as coded to respond to player input. In Zelda, you solve puzzles and get keys to new puzzles, and all along you're being advanced closer and closer to the dungeon's end. In Shadow of the Colossus, you do the exact same thing, except you don't get keys. The Colossi are unlocked by you hitting their weak spot, which they respond to, and that response expands their scalable area so that you can advance through them. The single most impressive colossus, in my opinion, in terms of player direction, would be Malice, the final one, who incidentally is easily my favorite of the bunch. I never drop the game once I've picked it up because the thrill of facing this guy is just too much for me not to go through the whole thing. The mood for this fight is set immediately with the apparent death of Agro. Agro has been our closest friend in the game and her death harkens back to the end of Eco. Remember right before the endgame's dark mood was set when Eco and Yorda were separated on a bridge after which Eco had to face the rest of the game alone? Well, Wander and Agro, bridge separation, dark mood for the rest of the game until the very very end? Just saying, Ueda has a fingerprint. And the mood set by this separation is amplified by the uniquely cruel weather. Malice's fight begins as a situational awareness fight where you need to consider above all else your environments to stay safe from Malice's fireball attacks. Not because they deal heavy damage, costing you your hard progress, but because they knock you back pretty far if they hit you, which costs you soft progress. The next objective is to scale Malice, and here's the thing. Malice is 66 meters tall, which according to the Shadow of the Colossus wiki, and as verified by my quick image searching, means that scaling Malice is the equivalent of climbing the clock face of Big Ben. 
Originally, the game was supposed to have 48 colossi, and over development, that number was gradually scaled back to 16, but Malice, apparently, was supposed to be 16 before that was the final number. I.e., Malice was not designed to be the final Colossus. During development, they did like Malice a lot though, and it is entirely possible that they would have moved it back to be the last one had there been more, but I wonder how many elements of this fight were integrated from the initial conceptual final Colossus. I doubt, for example, that the bad weather here would have been retained. I doubt very much that Agro would have died before fighting Malice, because we would then have to walk our ass across the map to the subsequent Colossi. But that, that's sort of the thing about Malice. I know, because I've read some of his design documents, that this was not supposed to be the final boss. But it is such a culmination of everything that precedes it, that I can't imagine what they would have done to top this. Malice feels as fitting as the conclusion to the Colossus fights as Valus felt being the beginning of them. There are the occasional bosses which build on an element from a previous one, like how Avion has an asymmetrical environmental access which is brought back for Hydras and Kuramori respectively, or like how Kuramori must be rendered helpless on its back before being killable, and the very next Colossus Basaran must also be flipped on its back before being fought. But Malice, I don't think, could have been placed anywhere else without feeling out of place. The mood around the boss is very heavy, and the stakes in fighting it are the most extreme in the game. No boss has as much soft progress in the line with the fall as this one does, and no boss has as many different puzzles to solve for its completion. It's the absolute culmination of everything which precedes it. After Wander has slain Malus, Iman and his men arrive to the shrine and get a brief moment to assess the situation. Keyword being brief. Wander's seemingly dead body is quickly lifted by Dorman and transported to them before they can really get their bearings. Each Colossus's death was followed by their blood impaling Wander. This is the cause of his gradual rotting throughout the game, and in the end, there is seemingly nothing left of him except the raw impulse to revive Mono. Considering Ueda's opinion about the need for straightforward narratives for video games, it makes a tremendous amount of sense that he'd rely on repetition, as I elaborated on earlier, to hammer home the story. I go back to the example of how the chief changing variable with the Colossus fights has been Wander's physical state, telling us something may be afoot with killing them. And the killing of them was a great showcase of both the individual majesty of the Colossi and the immense vulnerability of Wander. Wander's physical state is even referenced mid-combat at one point if you pay attention. Once you aggro a Colossus, its eyes turn red. Once it loses you, however, they go blue again, indicating that the Colossus is no longer hostile. There is a point in the Malice fight, right before you shoot its shoulder, where Malice has you in its palm, and when it looks at Wander and sees the state he's in, Malice ceases all hostilities. Shadow of the Colossus's combat is about contrasting the vulnerability and desperation of Wander and the majesty of the Colossi. It's seen in how he clings to them when they move, and in how the camera does an incredible job of highlighting how beautiful they really are. Additionally, the combat and writing sections served as a forum on which we have built a dependency on and appreciation for Acro. Acro is arguably as integral to the game as the Colossi are, and was one of the biggest headaches in terms of balancing. On one hand, Acro needs to reject certain player input since it's a living creature first, utility second, but on the other, she can't be your enemy or else you'll start to dislike her. She's your best friend in the game, but the depth of this relationship was surprising, according to Ueda, who remarked that it was more accidental than intentional. But it's one of those happy accidents which, fun fact, served as the creative spark for The Last Guardian. Speaking of Guardians, 
The ones we encounter in the end have come to stop Wander from releasing Dorman. They want him to be dormant, you see. The exact backstory of the game is a bit hazy, but we know that there are some definites and Eamon is largely the best source for a lot of that. For one, it's because of him that we know Wander stole the ancient sword. Eamon came here because he assumably noticed that the sword was gone and that there were these crazy light pillars in the sky above the Forbidden Lands. He also recognizes Wander, which is interesting because he is surprised to see that this has been his doing. After witnessing Wander's degenerated form, he declares him possessed by the dead and orders that Wander be slain, which is when Dorman appropriates Wander's body in one of my all-time favorite video game moments. I've mentioned this a lot already, but Team Eco are really good at using repetition of familiar elements for narrative purposes, and the way Ueda tells us what has happened to Wander isn't with words. It's by showing us that as he is stabbed in the middle of his poncho, he gusses blood exactly the same way the Colossi had. And the symbol on his poncho all of a sudden gains a bit of significance because it sort of looks like the weak spot symbol on the Colossi themselves. Not much is known about Dorman's backstory. You're supposed to fill in the gaps here, but Ueda has let some things slip over the years. Dorman was sealed away long ago for committing forbidden acts. Also, long ago, the Colossi were idols which people worshipped. Those Colossi are the bone and muscles, and the shadows are the blood. That blood is Dorman. It gave life to the Colossi, and after we release it from them, they immediately collapse and the blood enters Wander. His gradual rot is the result of hosting Dorman within himself. The game makes great use of juxtapositions for emphasis all throughout. Right, and then fight. Wander is small, Colossi are big. Wander is vulnerable and clumsy, the Colossi are majestic. And Dorman is an interesting figure to examine here because it's both sides of its own juxtaposition. Dorman talks to us through a heavenly light in the sky, but its form is nothing short of demonic. Dorman is treated as a vile creature by Lord Emon and the guards, but Dorman has a sense of fair play, as is seen in the beginning where Dorman warns Wander of the heavy cost of his request. Additionally, prior to the confrontation with Emon, Dorman was voiced by a man and woman simultaneously. This complexity makes it very hard to grasp what specifically Dorman is, but the final juxtaposition we see in Dorman goes a long way in closing down the experience, because in the end, we play as a mixture of Dorman and Wander crouched in the middle of the shrine, watching helplessly as our enemies seal us away again. The inevitable defeat at the hands of Emon and his guards closes out the game with us being given the doomed task of running to Mono while being pulled into the pool in the shrine. When we first met Wander, he was journeying to the Forbidden Lands. Aside from his ability to ride a horse and assumably the foreknowledge the player had about the game's central premise, there isn't much given to characterize Wander until he reaches the shrine, which is where the game fills us in on who he is. But we already know him, because we know Ueda and his protagonists, those vulnerable young men, compared to the grandness of the adventure they inhabit, who find themselves aided by AI partners. In comparing Wander to Eco, Ueda remarked that Wander was cool. But in action, we see that that doesn't exclude his vulnerability one bit. In fact, even Eco didn't trip over himself so much. The reason Wander comes across as the more competent one is because of the Indiana Jones effect. We sympathize more with the hero who gets punched in the face than the one who's invincible, and while Eco definitely wasn't the latter, Wander's struggles and the blows they deal him are so much grander that even though you can sympathize with the Colossi, you probably can't help but admire Wander's persistence. His emergence into the Forbidden Lands broke a seal and restarted the flow of its stagnated time. Emon's opening monologue goes, That place began from the resonance of intersecting points. They are memories replaced by ends and not and etched into stone. Blood, young sprouts, sky and the one with the ability to control beings made from light in that world it is said that if one should wish it, 
one can bring back the souls of the dead, but to trespass upon that land is strictly forbidden. And I think this isn't just here for the player's benefit. I think this is something Iman actually said to Wander, which is where he got the idea to bring Mono to the land to revive her, the obsession which has caused him to effectively rot away. Player analogs are mostly characterized by their interactions with others and the world in which the player expresses the available mechanics. And the absence of, for example, graceful recovery frames of movement means that Wander, in spite of the player, cannot express that grace. He is vulnerable however good you are at the game. He's shown to be confident and somewhat capable in the beginning, but that doesn't really last, and the end shows him incredibly submissive. He's unable to fight off the guards and unable to reach Mono again. This kid just moments ago was scaling impossibly tall creatures, being dragged through air and water can't overcome being absorbed by the pool. Emon and his men make it out of the Forbidden Land before the bridge collapses, and certain about the path to the land having been forever sealed, Emon remarks that he hopes that Wander will be able to atone for his crime should he have survived the ordeal. After this chaos, Mona wakes up, as per Dorman's promise in the beginning, and Acro limps her way back into the shrine. It is a true testament to Team Ego's ability to have the player bond with AI partners that so many people were so very relieved in the end to see Acro alive. In the pool, Mono picks up a horned infant boy. His horns are said by Ueda to represent elements which could not be purified by the spring, which she takes, along with Agro, to a higher level of the shrine, the Secret Garden. And here's something interesting you may or may not have known about. You can control the infant boy's cries during the credits, because yes, that's Wander. Ueda said of the ending that it is in fact a happy one. That it was a deliberate reversal of expectation, since the convention in stories dealing with the resurrection of the dead is that they have tragic endings. Shadow of the Colossus's happy ending, according to Ueda, is brought about by the humanity. And that makes a certain amount of sense. And Ueda also said that the destruction of the bridge in the end isn't random. Destruction is a way of giving closure to the work. It marks a clear cutoff point which, once reached, means that the story is over. Ueda notes that he thinks it's important for the game to not just take the player somewhere else, but for it to deliver them back to their own world once the adventure has ended. The eagle flying into the Forbidden Lands is a cutscene which plays prior to the main menu as a means of transporting you back into the game world in case you didn't beat the game in a single playthrough and are uh, playing it again uh, halfway through. And funnily enough, the destruction of the bridge mirrors Eco's ending, which saw the destruction of the castle. With the adventure at an end, we are taken away from it by the Eagle, who flies us out of the Forbidden Lands again. After, we see that life has returned to it just as Dorman promised it would. The game utilized contrast and repetition for emphasis of its main narrative themes. Team Eco's games are all very much written to express something games are good at. For Eco, this was holding someone's hand. For Shadow of the Colossus, it's interacting with bosses and learning to feel empathy for them. The game emphasizes the beauty of the land and the colossi's place in them to hammer home your role as the invader, come in to destroy. Wanders rot aside, you can see the remains of the colossi, you hear the sad music which follows their death, and see the blood invade Wander, and you quickly begin to reflect on your actions. But before I can sign off on that reading, let me reiterate what I said a while ago by reading you one of Ueda's most significant quotes. When asked to comment on the Taoist themes of the game, Ueda remarked, This is my personal opinion, but I don't really get conceptions based on expression media, like films and novels upon making a video game. Even if I had some kind of themed or philosophical images in mind, I wouldn't cling on to them, and rather value the consistency and harmony that are inevitably generated through the game design process itself. This is because I feel that clinging on to a theme 
is far too inefficient when making a video game. If video game production was to be compared to writing, my thoughts is that it's closer to looking for words to fit in the squares of a crossword puzzle rather than crafting sentences with whatever words you like onto a fresh sheet of manuscript paper. Hence, it is still far from reaching the degree of freedom of expression that novels and film have creation wise. In this regard, I think I'm the type of creator with a designer's perspective rather than that of an author. Before you marry yourself to a certain reading of the game, remember that its creative lead has gone on record to say that his biggest inspiration is watching movie trailers, because they give him context which he can piece together a narrative from. It might be that the game is about Wander ruining the natural balance of the land, but you could also say that he's the good guy come to purify it of evil and in the end be purified of it himself. This is what it could mean that life returns after Dorman is sealed away again, and the stagnant flow of time has been restarted. The game actively pulled from a variety of myths, so pinpointing one specific meaning is not a task for outsiders. It could be about obsession, but it could just as easily be about sacrifice, or purity. But until Team Eco comes clean, Shadow of the Colossus is what you draw from it. Now, narrative ambiguity isn't everyone's cup of tea, but that was the stated point of the game. The Eco concept trailer ended with Yorda touching Eco's face, and that game was about touching an AI. The minute to minute was an afterthought to deliver that emotion, and whenever the team got lost, that was what they looked to to find their way again. The Shadow of the Colossus concept trailer is about killing a colossus. That's what the game is about. The titular shadow describes the impact of these massive creatures and the impact of your interaction with them. The shadow they cast on your experience and how interacting with them and the world they inhabited made you feel. Thanks for watching and stay tuned because next December, I'll be releasing two long-awaited secret videos. I was gonna do an additional video on Shadow Tower, but life kinda got in the way, so that's gonna have to be pushed back for the time being. I'm still operating this channel on the bi-monthly release schedule, where every month I swap between making some videos for you guys, and then making my game. Last month I finished phase one of production, so, after about 10 months of producing the thing, 5 of which were active, the game is finally taking on a face I can recognize, which means I can finally share with you guys the concept video I'm putting together for it. So, no Shadow Tower video, but a Project BB discussion video. Lose some, a win some. So stay tuned for that. And of course, don't think I've forgotten why this has been such a FromSoft heavy year. Plans remain unchanged on my side. Next March, I'm releasing the long-awaited Bloodborne commentary. And if this interests you, I recommend subscribing and clicking the bell icon to receive notification. Also, like and comment for all of that good old interacting with the algorithm. Aside from the channel, I can be found on Twitter, same name, and on the Essays and Espresso podcast. The footage I used in this video was supplied by Project Longplay, as played by channel regular at this point, Spasbo4, as well as by Longplay Archive, both being linked in the description box below. Also, linked below is my Patreon, where I give out early access to videos to members. Now with all of that sign off, out of the way, I hope this video was worth the time you spent watching it. I've been Acer Aesthetics, and until next time, Take care.